Hey guys, it's Khadija with this is Armview.com and today we are here for a special, special treat at the Marian Anderson Museum in Philadelphia, PA. We are here celebrating um, Women's International History Month with the CEO of the museum, Miss Jillian Patricia Patel. Welcome. Good morning, Khadija. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you so much for taking time out. You have a huge schedule, and we understand that, and we respect that and honor it. So I thank you so much for taking this time to just talk about the museum, Miss um, Anderson's legacy, and everything that um, goes with that. Absolutely. Yeah, so let's just first talk about um, your journey. And how did you come about working with the Anderson Museum and what Miss um, Anderson meant to you? Absolutely. I started out in the artistic, cultural landscape as a child. From an early age, my mother had me in every artistic and cultural program that existed in Philadelphia. Yeah. So I started out with the Pennsylvania Ballet. I was singing on the choirs. I was doing television with, um, you know, all of the Saturday morning television specials and all of that. So it was a really wonderful experience to have growing up in that era where the arts and culture were a big thing to develop and foster a child's youth and ability here in Philadelphia. So I'm glad of that. I'm a product of the public school system and the education and all of my teachers were so very instrumental in my rearing, especially those that were influenced with the cultural and arts as teachers very important. At the age of 13, when I was in high school, I became a Marian Anderson Scholar Artist through the introduction of the founder of the Marian Anderson Museum, Marian Anderson's only mentee, the world-class concert pianist, Lady Blanche Burton Miles. And so when she founded this museum, which was Marian Anderson's home, this National Historical Landmark that she uh, built up through the city and the state and the National Department of Interior. She also reinvigorated the Marian Anderson Scholar Artist Program that Marian Anderson herself started wow. here in Philadelphia. So I was honored to be a part of the group of young artists who were studying classical music and being trained up in the ways and um, the image, the light and shine of Marian Anderson. I'm blessed to have gone to uh, not only the High School for Creative and Performing Arts here in Philadelphia, but also get my degrees from the University of the Arts, uh, which, you know, ironically, <laughs> was the Philadelphia Academy of Music and Art, the mm -hmm. same yeah. institution that told Marian Anderson when she tried to apply to be a student there mm -hmm. in 1924 that they would never admit any blacks to that institution of higher learning. And over 80 years after that, I walked out of that university with my degrees. So I'm honored to stand on the shoulders of Marian Anderson, everything that she suffered and went through so that young black women artists wouldn't have to go through what she went through. So I, I feel such a weight of responsibility on my shoulders for many reasons where the Mary Anderson Museum is concerned, but also because you want to live your life with grace and dignity the way Mary Anderson did. You want to be able to make good on what she sacrificed so that, you know, we could have better as young artists in this industry. Um, so it's, it's very important to me. Yes, wow, you said a lot there, and I love that you um, just touched on, which we're going to talk about, her legacy, because she was a pioneer, not only just for opera music and the opera genre, but, you know, the beginning of what would be rhythm and blues. Absolutely. And um, so I, I just want to dig in just a little, dig into um, some of the things that you said, and, you know, can we just talk about how she had her first, <clears throat> excuse me, she had her first sold out potentially, even though it didn't cost because it was at church, but her first sold out or packed house 
at eight years old in her first write-up in the newspaper. I mean, and she talks about that in a documentary that you actually are featured in, um, which PBS, which we will have the link in the bottom too for you guys to watch it because it's a phenomenal piece that they did on her. Yes, and you were f fantastic. Um, but how you start from having humble beginnings, you know, being born in Virginia, coming to Philadelphia as a child, like an infant, right? Well, she was born in Philadelphia, actually. Her parents, oh, okay. So her mother was from um, West Virginia, okay. Anna Rucker Anderson. And her father's side of the family, John Benjamin Anderson, his mother and father, Isabella and Benjamin, they were from West Virginia, but they came to Philadelphia during the early part of the Great Migration, yes. right after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And they settled in on a house on Fitzwater Street around 16th um, when they first arrived. And it was, you know, they had eight children. Right. Five of them survived childbirth. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot, you know, especially for black women. It still is something that is a play in our community health-wise with mortality rates for maternity for black women. But with all of those struggles, the strong um, fortitude of Isabella Anderson, she had five that survived. And John Benjamin was the eldest. And this is a tall, striking man, six foot three and a half, right? Yeah. Um, a chocolate skin, distinguished looking gentleman. And he wanted to be a man of education. He wanted to attend the uh, school for colored youth on Bainbridge Street in 10th. But because there were so many people in the family, he felt a responsibility to help his parents. And he took four jobs at the Reading Terminal. Yes, I was going to mention that just talking about her humble beginnings yes. of um, her father being a laborer, a jack of all trades, at working at the Reading Terminal, and then her mother being a licensed certified teacher in Virginia, but it's not being transferred here in Philadelphia. Yes, which is extremely unfortunate because yeah. during one hot summer, his parents sent him back to West Virginia so he could help his uncle on the sharecropping plantation for which the family came. Yeah. And when he happened to see this young, beautiful uh, <laughs> lady walking on this dirt road in West Virginia, he had to run over uh, to the from the field to the, the road and talk to her. She was carrying school books. She was a teacher. Yes. But if you can understand the dynamic, he is six foot three, she was four foot eight. Correct. So yes. it's like he called her his pint-sized beauty and he wanted to explain to her what was going on in Philadelphia. It was really, you know, or, or the turn of the century getting ready to happen and the industrial age, which is going on big time in Philadelphia because all of the factory work was happening here. Right. And um, the fact that he had those four jobs, he, he was proud of that. He was. You know, he, he worked as a coalman, an iceman, and a porter on the trains, but also a steel worker helping put America's railroad system together. That's history in itself. Yes. So her family was already making history before she even made history. And what I love about it, you know, he brought Anna Rucker Anderson to Philadelphia with hopes and dreams of starting a new life together. It was rather crushing to have her experience early on that racist setback here in Philadelphia being told that the state and the city didn't qualify teachers in the South because uh, coming here to the North having their certifications didn't match these up here. We all know that that was a uh, Straight, uh, racially motivated. And, um, and I also love that not only did he bring his hopes and dreams and instill that in his children, but also just hard work and determination because even though it was a no, you can only be this laborer and no, you can't be a teacher, but you can clean John Wanamaker. Like, how humbling, how determined, how um, so much spark was instilled in her at a young age. And then being able to perform, you know, and go out there in church and then them noticing her and being like, okay, you're the hot ticket. You're the one we're gonna put on. Absolutely, I believe her father's strength illuminated in her from a child 
and her mother's faith and demure spirit. You have that combination. That is Marian Anderson. Mm -hmm. And at age eight, being featured on the choir, being able to sing from soprano all the way to baritone starting at age six, but the baby contralto at age eight and having the concert at Union Baptist Church, having the listening ear of Roland Hayes, a formidable black tenor who was yes. traveling the world We're gonna talk about him. and getting that momentum from him to have her being featured in one of his spring concerts at the Union Baptist Church made for the beginnings and the makings of Marian Anderson, which really um, is phenomenal because you talk about the strength and her work ethic. When her father met with his untimely uh, death, yes. she said that she found it her obligation as the oldest child to step forward and to help her mother. You know, it's not something that she had to do. Right, at 12. That's right. And it's around the same age that you were when you joined her program. <laughs> so, I mean, look at the parallel um, life that you guys are leading together. So, I just want to talk about um, another parallel piece. I mean, there's a lot of obstacles that she's faced, a lot of obstacles you have faced as being the CEO of the Marion Anderson Museum. But let's just go back into time during the Scott Joplin era and how... Um, there weren't a lot of jobs out there for African American artists to begin with in how we are resilient and how they created their own shows um, so they can have an opportunity to display their gifts and their talents. Um, and you had a recent show with the Porgy and Bess and you put that on. Can you talk about how um, that kind of is parallel in itself, you know, and what it means to be an African American opera artist today as it was back then. Well, it's all born out of the Mary Anderson Scholar Artist Program that we do these concerts and seasons of shows. Now, we, the scholar artists, are independently our own artists, our own professional uh, performers out here doing this, but being a part of this program, being a part of this cultural institution that Marian Anderson started, though many, many decades ago, has a certain weight of, of dignity, strength, class determination for our people, which is amazing. Office is, and the address was here, 
right? Yeah, it's like yes. she was her own, you know, yes. her own press agent, her mm -hmm. own boss, her own this, and, and that's early on. But that's also black women. Yes, that's what it is. That's what we do. Those are the foundations of who we are, and I loved to see that because it let me know then, you know, this is nothing new. Right. This is what we've been doing. This is what Marian Anderson did. This is what her mother did yes. for her. And I felt that to be so great. I mean, we all want to cheer when Marian, you know, got uh, Billy King to be her uh, accompanist and her agent uh, touring, doing her first tour around the United States Midway Tour to get her the $4,000 to pay for this house mm -hmm. and be one of the youngest and first black owners of a uh, property in Philadelphia. Yes. Yeah. But the mirror, I, I love, and this before saw here rocking, all of those things, I love that she and her mother were running her business. Yes! Yes! yes. Oh, I, I love that. I love that too. That's amazing. It you is know? so amazing. And it, and it gives hope. Let it give hope yes. to us in this millennial generation. Let it give hope to the younger ones that will come behind us. This is what we have been doing. Right. And if it comes to that, we will continue yes. to do that. Yes. You know, because that's what's in our blood. That's our strength. That's our determination. That is I, I my my favorite new inspirational quote to myself when I get down. Never underestimate the strength of a black woman. The strength of a black woman is everything. And it has been everything. And Mary Anderson is a testament to that. Her mother, her sisters, what they did creating this early little enterprise yes. of voice before she got to the next level and the next level. And the fact that we have these in our archives that we can refer to, I think it's fabulous. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. And just talking about the level of um, excellence and determination, fire and drive that um, African American women possess and that we hold this in our DNA. Um, we talked about her mom working at Wanamaker's, but for her to go on this tour and, like you said, get the money to purchase the home, she did something that I feel like anyone who's ever worked hard really want to do to get their mother. She was like the first example of what it means to give back and what it means to, like, your mom sacrificed so much. And I'm gonna make sure, make the call to say, you know what, my mom's not doing this anymore. She's gonna be my manager. Because it, because like, it was amazing. It was so much that was built in her. Mm -hmm. You know, she often said, when my father died, several people told my mother, put your children, your daughters, in a workhouse. Put your daughters in an away institute. Marry someone else. Have another one. You know, that's often what would happen during, during that, that time, time right? in the early 1900s. They would send children away to a workhouse or an institute. They would remarry and have another life with somebody else. Her mother refused to do that. And she said, no, this is what God has given me. This is what I would do to remind the viewers in perspective of what era we're talking about. This isn't like 2000s, the 90s, where we had issues and we still do have issues, but we're talking the 1920s, the 1930s, like it is unheard of, of the things that she is able to accomplish. And, um, and with, with the oppression yes. of racism, with the oppression of sexism and all that was happening then. You know, she talked early on about going on these uh, little mini tours and performing in Washington, performing in Atlanta, performing in um, Mississippi and, and those type of places and getting on a train and her mother being with her mm -hmm. and they couldn't go and eat in the club car because they wouldn't allow blacks to do that. They had to go to the back of the train and sit where the um, smoky horn engine was. So if they opened the window, mm -hmm. all of the soot from the train would come in to their little, um, their little seating quarters that they had. Her mother packed away nuts, oranges, and a sandwich for them to share. So that stuff stays.
stayed with her. Yes. So when it was time and she had the money and she had the wealth and opportunity, oh, of course she gave back because she, she remembered what it was like when her mother was with her traveling to these places and all they had was a, a sandwich to share and oranges. Right. You know, can you just, uh, I mean, can you just have it? Like, and, and it, you know, it, that doesn't mean something to everybody, but it means something to me. It means because, something to me. Because my mother yeah. has been with me my entire life and in my career as a young artist. I call her the stage mother. She's the great stage mother, they call her. <laughs> but there's been times when she and I, that was our story. And we traveled up and down so I could get to these performances and get to these things. We had a sandwich. We had to deal with all kind of unnecessary stuff in this journey of trying to get where we are. And that, see, nothing new, but what a model to look at. And she took care of her mother. And I, I appreciate that. I love that because she never forgot. And when she took care of her mother, she took care of others too. And what a blessing. What a blessing. And I want to just also just talked about you know her father as you mentioned he passed when she was 12 and she had to stop going to school and was decided to help him work because she didn't want her mother she wanted to help share the load well she was she was going in between time because her grandmother Isabella refused to let her stop oh well that was what I was going to talk about yeah. next she, she, that that was was she said if you if yeah. you don't work you still going to school yes so that that's what I wanted to talk about um instilling a uh, strictness and structure. Yes. I feel like her grandmother was that for her. And um just talking about obstacles and what people perceive you as and how you don't have to receive that, right? Because when she was uh, one of the moments in her life where she got what was considered to be perceived as this golden opportunity to be able to, I believe, um, was it work, not work with, but study under um, author, um, his name is slipping me at the time, where he wanted to, he was going to mentor her, give her lessons, but he wanted her in exchange to clean her house and be the maid. And grandma said, no, absolutely not. Right? And how, how crushing could that be? Like, let's just talk a little bit about that and how it's like you as a young person, you're like, no, but this is great because this is. This is the guy, and, and you know, you know, in, in, in that time, it was it was an earnest um, thought because Roland Hayes made the introduction, correct, and he felt that she could benefit from this training, from this voice work, from this coaching at an early age. But number, you know, it's, Isabella Anderson had a number of concerns. Number one, she was far too young to be going to Boston. That wasn't going to happen. Number one. Number one. <laughs> and number two, if you're going to go and you're going to study, you're going to go and study without having to work yourself to death while trying for someone right. else to do it. Mm -hmm. She felt if it was going to happen, it would be another way that would be 100 beneficial to her granddaughter. Yes. So even though that was in everybody else's mind a really good offer. Yes. Yeah, you know, it, uh, Isabella Anderson said absolutely not. The answer is no. <laughs> the answer is no. Grandma and mom, they normally know and they have the answer and we're like wanting to fight and you know, and you put it to today's times where it's like so many things we're like, no, but this is this is it. You don't understand, you don't understand. And they're like, ah, ah. let me let you know. This I've lived a little long. I lived a little longer. Listen to me on this one. That's I'm right. so glad that she did because who knows where she would have been. She could have just been this incredible performer cleaning up the people's floor. That's right. Um, so let's just talk about uh, her voice and how she is quoted as saying that singing a high C was like a lark and it was just effortless for her. How, how difficult is it to um, sing a high C and what does it mean to be uh, a connoisseur alto? A contralto. A contralto. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, 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 it's really something. If you have that wide range that Marian Anderson had, mm -hmm. and when she said that, she was reflecting on her youth. <laughs> because when you're, when you're young, you feel like you can, it's so easy, and you can do it, and it just rolls off. Yeah. As the age peels away and peels back at you, it's a little harder, step by step by step. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, she was dubbed this contralto, given this moniker. Mm -hmm. She really was a genuine soprano. She had those 
beautiful high top notes and that spin was glorious, especially in her youth. But she was very demure and she was very gracious. And when they started labeling her as that and her uh, company for um, management and, and agency let it stick, she didn't try to turn it and, and twist it away. But that's what happens when you're blessed with such a wide range gift. She had low tones that mm -hmm. she could access at any given point. Yes. She had a consistent mix and then her high notes and her top notes were just glorious and spinny and wonderful. So she was blessed to have the octave range that she had um, in her life's time. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And um, let's just talk about not only her impact that she had on the opera genre, but R&B and music as we know it today, because she was the first African-American woman to be signed to RCA Records. Correct, in 1924. Yes. So, and I, I, I love the like small detail, but I think it's a major detail that when she gets signed, on the record, or not, I forget exactly what they call it, but the record saying not only her name, but that she's an African or a Negro gospel singer, right? That's the beginning. And at the end of her life and her career, she's just known as this world global phenomenon. And it, they kind of, I mean, race was still there, but that wasn't, that she kind of, she broke that barrier. Absolutely, and you know, we can challenge the fact that not only with RCA Victor, well, she's the first African-American woman, that she was the first African-American, because there's a difference between those who were laying down tracks and laying down singles that were put out there, one, two, sider, yeah. than having a contract where you're pressing albums. And I mean, she was pressing them once she Come started on. with the first of Deep River and, um, you know, uh, for uh, the, the, the other side, because she, she had two on one and two on the other, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, not only did she have such a beneficial contract with RCA Victor recording, but they translated her when she went over to Europe in 1928 uh, on when she had the 10 year stint um, that was broken up in between, she signed with the BMI label, which is the RCA Victor European subsidiary. Mm -hmm. So she was pressing records over in Europe and pressing records here and she was working both labels at the same time. Really nobody else was doing that. Like she, she, yeah. she started the standard and then after that came the rest of it, which is really uh, awesome to say because working it the way she did, by the time America reaches 1938, she is the highest paid African American artist in the United States. You have wonderful people that she developed these amazing lifelong friendships with, like Josephine Baker, like Paul Robeson, like Duke Ellington, like Ella Fitzgerald, Lena Horne, Billie Holiday, Louis Armstrong, all of these people were in this house. Yeah. Mm. Were breathing their rarefied air because even in Philadelphia, during the Jim Crow era, they could perform mm -hmm. at the Schubert Theater, at the Royal, some of these other theaters, but they couldn't get a hotel room or open table seating because they were black. Mm -hmm. After their performances, Mary Anderson invited them here to this house where they could dine in peace. They could fellowship together. Our beloved late founder, Lady Blanchford Miles, would play on this Steinway. She would play the classics, the beautiful music of Mozart mm -hmm. and Schubert and the uh, Prokofi and all of that. And then they would have a jazz jam where Duke Ellington and his band would play. And Louis Armstrong would play his horn and all these things. So this beautiful sacred space. Mm -hmm. We are still living with these souls and breathing their rarefied air. And that's amazing. Because it was all happening on this Philadelphia street. In this neighborhood where our people were part of the fabric of building our nation and our history. And I think that's fabulous. And that's all brought to you by Marian Anderson. How amazing is that? Amazing. 
is that don't let anyone ever tell you you can't do something. That's right. Or put stipulations on your mind. That's right. right. And um, can we just talk about Amanda Aldrich and how when she met Marion Anderson, she kind of took her under her wing and became, a, you know, her mentor. Do you feel like, like how you just mentioned all of those incredible, incredible pioneers, African American, not just African American that they were African American artists, but what they set, um, <laughs> that they were pillars for different multiple genres, um, but that camaraderie that they had for each other. Do you feel that is the same now within the um, opera genre? Well, let's take away from the opera genre altogether and let's just talk universal music. Okay. Universal music, black music, black culture. They celebrated each other. Now, there, that's not to say that there weren't moments and times of issues and of competition, course. squabbles and stuff. But for the most part, they celebrated each other. They celebrated the fact that Marian Anderson was a classical black artist singer. Duke Ellington adored Marian Anderson. She loved him. One of her favorite genres of music, she said, was jazz. She didn't feel comfortable enough <laughs> singing it because she didn't feel that she could do what Ella could do and vice versa. But she loved it and she would sit in this corner with her uh, big Victrola and then her phonograph and all. And she would listen to these beautiful albums that her friends would put out and do. And to the point where Duke Ellington had commissioned the entire album of Come Sunday that he recorded at Abyssinian uh, Baptist Church in New York. And he wrote it for Marian Anderson in her honor. He wanted her to record the track from Sunday, but she turned him down because she, you know, she was classical at her. And she <laughs> yeah. didn't want to, you know, try to interpret jazz-wise, but he was begging her to record it. Oh but my gosh, she imagine did not, what that was I'm telling you, everybody's oh saying it, yes. But still, he dedicated the album to her, and I think that's a testament of what you're asking. Yeah. The celebration of one another, the support, the championship of one another as artists was strong then. Yes. It doesn't exist like it exists. Did then. It's yeah. not there today. And that is the unfortunate episode for black people in the arts. It shouldn't be. We should be lifting each other up and supporting each other, living to the core of what true music is, true black music is, what we bring to the table as artists and our value. I'm not talking about what's being pressed out there for a quick dollar. I'm talking about yeah. music that reaches the soul mm. of a human and what we produced. Oh my gosh, I have chills just listening to you speak about all of these things because it is true and it doesn't matter, like you said, universal music. Um, people are feeling that everywhere and how it's not just like, can you just imagine her just being like, I'm just gonna do this for likes. I'm gonna just do this just because someone is telling me so. It, it's just. Just a different she, mindset. She, she didn't operate her life like that. Yes. She went in avenues that made sense for her, for her body, for her mental well-being, mm -hmm. for her spiritual health, and that what she was comfortable with. Yes. I just want to talk about because you mentioned it of how she had so much love. She wasn't necessarily out there. She was on the front line, but not on the front line being like, look at me, this is what I'm gonna say, but her actions as far as her performances and the things that she allowed to happen, that was the silent barrier breakers that she was doing. Um, I loved uh, how she, like you said before, you can perform here, but you can't stay here, and that happened to her in Princeton. That, I feel like that's a, that's a very important note to mention because not only just for African American artists, but she was friends with Albert Einstein. Can you just let us in on a little of how that came about to be? You know, and again, this is something that wasn't new for Marian Anderson. She right. faced this so many times, even before the Princeton incident of you can perform here, but you can't even have a dressing room here. She had to change outside in alleyways because they wouldn't give her a dressing room because she was black and used the bathroom outside and put a gown on and all of that in the open air and public space. 
when she was given this opportunity to perform in Princeton, nowhere in the Princeton Common yeah. would offer her a room, would offer her a place to stay. So disgusting. When Albert Einstein got a whiff of that, he and his wife and daughter, he said, all right, can you reach out to her people and tell them I'm gonna talk to them. I would love for her to be my honored guest here at my estate. Who was doing that back then? What like, did I tell you? Like, like nobody, nobody was doing that. Like, and it was a, the Albert Einstein? And it was, a, it was a shock to her. Yes. Because she didn't realize that she was even in his orbit in terms of musically or any of that. But Albert Einstein was up on it long before people realized <laughs> right. he was Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. And, you know, coming there with him and, and, and meeting his family, staying on his estate, having him attend the performance, you know, that butted a long-standing friendship to the point where Marion Anderson brought Albert Einstein to Philadelphia and the original Pyramid Club, which was owned by African Americans, mm -hmm. by the way. Um, <laughs> so, so at the Pyramid Club, which was owned by African Americans, um, they often had lectures where they would engage the members to a higher source of elevation and education. So they could take that education out to where they were, whether it was to back to the students at Lincoln University or Cheney, or if it was in the greater community itself, whatever they were doing in the business industry at the time or what have you. And because the uh, founder and the members of the Pyramid Club, which was owned by African Americans originally at the time, um, they honored Marian Anderson multiple times. When she brought Albert Einstein to Philadelphia, he was only too glad and honored to come with her to the Pyramid Club and speak to these young black men that were attending university and let him know his relative theories that he was so famous for and what he was making all of uh, these uh, this money for and book sales and all that. And these young black men were learning the STEM work before it was STEM. Yes, and that's at the heart and the core of Albert Einstein's beliefs and we have pictures of this, and, but brought to you by Marian Anderson. Come on. So you know what I'm saying? Yes. That's 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 the type of friendship, and just what it was about. That was her life, her heart, her spirit. The same relationship with First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. I was just going to talk about that because you you um, talked about the universities, the HBCUs, and how again. No man can close what God has for you. Can't. Talk about obstacles, the like constant obstacles, and just still having the will and desire. You, you're coming from Europe, right? You getting all this notoriety, and you are not even at the height of your career, but like people are just like in all of you, and you're selling out concerts. And and wait, let, let's make this a caveat too. Yes, I have this caveat in there. When Mary and Anderson was starting out here in Philadelphia, it was the community that was lifting her up. Yeah, right? because Philadelphia proper wasn't giving her her props. Yeah, Philadelphia was not acknowledging her and supporting her as an artist, as a young black woman, as they should. Philadelphia has a little bit of history with doing that often. <laughs> But yes. when she got back from Europe and she was being the toast of Paris and yes. being having all of these write-ups and all of these things, then when she came back here, yes, they wanted to acknowledge that and acted as though they had been supporting the whole time. They, yes. But I think the other part about it is, you know, just talking about coming off of that, these Jim Crow laws that she was faced right back, right in her face, like, bam, know your spot. In, in, where you, in society and where you should fit. And she was like, yep, yeah, not having that. I'll let you think what you want, but I'm gonna prove to you with my actions and my talents and my gifts. And um, coming back and having to, having the opportunity to perform for um, Howard University. But what happens, right? She can't fill the space because she has too many people that wanna come out and see her. So, um, talking about another obstacle, another venue, 
where it could potentially hold what, like 300 or so people. They're like, no. And her dear friend, as you were gonna mention, First Lady Theodore, um, Eleanor, excuse me, Roosevelt was like, no, we're not gonna have that, and wanted to have her at the Lincoln Memorial Center. Or, um, you know, the Lincoln Memorial, um, Landmark. Yeah, thank you. I, the word was escaping me. Landmark, where it was over like 50,000. 75. 70, right. 75,000 people. That was Talk about that. Like, that was the first open air concert in the United States. Like, yes. period. They have all these festivals that go on now. All yes. They have Mary and Anderson gave it first in the United States. Can we right? talk about it? We, we, we definitely can because at, at the end of 1938, Marianne is coming back from her third European educational tour experience. And as you said, she was the, the, the toast of the town then. But she was on the West Coast doing a tour. She had no idea what was going on when her agency uh, was dealing with all of the drama from the DAR yeah. and it being said that they would never have any blacks on their stage performing. Mm -hmm. And her, the great impresario, South Hurok tried every which way yeah. to smooth that over and get her in there and they just were unrelenting on that. Mary Nansen didn't find out until a reporter put a camera in her, uh, or a microphone in her face um, in the West Coast and say, what do you think of this? She knew nothing. Mm -hmm. The agency had shielded her from this. So she was caught off guard with that. But you know, again, this is someone who had faced racist uh, moments in her life all throughout her life so far, so she's extremely disappointed. She looks forward to something being worked out because, you know, it would be quite a disgrace based upon my race not to be able to perform for the people. You know, she left it there, but little did she know that it had already created back on the East Coast a swell of, 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 of concern and negativity and that the teachers union had started a protest and they were going to strike because they were tired in Washington of that, and they wanted no more of it. It had started a groundswell with the NAACP and President Walter White, who had already befriended Marian Anderson years prior, yes. because when he first heard her voice here in Philadelphia on Locust Street, while she was giving a uh, concert at Music Fun Hall, he sat in the back and he said, that young lady needs support. He was always supporting her from her first town hall performance and more. When this came about, he's like, oh no, 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 no. We're gonna start doing something about this. They started yes. writing in the newspaper mm -hmm. constantly. They started having speeches, all types of things. Then it was First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, who when Walter White had a meeting with her, he was like, something has to happen here because, you know, this, She's too important. And um, Eleanor Roosevelt understood that. Yeah. She recognized that. She knew what special gifts this young black woman had. And, and besides, she was a powerhouse of a leader yes. for our country. Yes. Even though in first lady title only, she had a lot of influence, influence power, thought, and sense. And before there was a blog, yes. before there were podcasts, Yes. Before any of that, she had a newspaper mm -hmm. that she produced twice a month. And she contacted the DAR. Yes. And she said, is this your stance? Are you not going to move off of this? And they said no. So she said, okay. And she sat down at her table at the White House and she took out her pen and paper. And she wrote her resignation letter. Yes. On Western Union paper. Yes. She made a statement on Western Union paper. Yes. And she was going to tell them, since you're not going to move off of your negative stance, which we believe is wrong. The wrong side of history. I'm rescinding my membership, my honorary membership that you all have given me. Honorary. <laughs> and I am going to set an example for how I believe our country should be. Now, and shame on you. And don't forget that part. I think that's the best. Oh yeah. Not only did she put them to shame, but with her beautifully well written letter, but she was just like, shame on you. Yeah, shame on you. But you know what? It could have been left there and 
she would have felt like she had done enough. That wasn't right. enough. No. You know, because how do we turn this moment of negativity into a teaching moment and to something that will uplift this young American? So that's when she and Walter White got in touch with Mr. Harold Ickes, who was the conservator of the United States Department of Interior. Those are the people who run the park service and all of the <laughs> national yeah. landmark spaces that belong to the government and the people. And they said, well, let's see, since they won't let her sing, let's let her sing, but let's let her sing so that a lot of people can hear her. Any and everyone. Not just the 2,500 that will fit in that space. How many people can we fit out here on Lincoln Memorial statue? And let's put her with Lincoln because he helped liberate right. the people. So that was their thinking process. Yeah. And then let's do it on a time where not only will people be able to converge and get there because it'll be a holiday, but on what we like to think of a sacred pure holiday. Mm -hmm. Let's do it on Easter. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. and so that's, that's how that came about. And you know, it, it's not like that was an easy thing for Mary to digest because right. she didn't even know that she wanted to do it. <laughs> start there. Let's start there. She wasn't <laughs> sure that she wanted to do it because she had a lot of, you know, concerns. Would people come to fill that space? It's a big space. And then you want me to sing a whole program out for that huge an audience. Right. And I don't be able to meet the moment. Can I live up to that? My and I did it. That's right. right. And I, for somebody who was so quiet in personality and spirit, that stayed with her from the time her management told her it's happening, get used to it. <laughs> right. Till she stepped her feet out there on that platform. And she heard the first note on the piano, My Country Tis a Thing. Yes. And you could see it from the playback. She was touching her collar. She, you know, gave that pensive look. She had a couple swallows. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a lot. It's an overwhelming experience. Yes. To because say the least. People were out there yelling her name before it started. You know, you had celebrities out there mixing with the common human, you know, you had uh, prize fighters, you had Tallulah Bankhead actress, you had all these people out there, and they're like, Marianne, Marianne, and she's like, I'm just, I'm this young girl from, from Philly. Philly. Right. <laughs> right. Philly. How did I get into this? Yes, but when she closed her eyes and she finished singing, you know, that was she wasn't a young successful artist anymore. That was that that, 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 that was conversation had passed. That was the turn. She was a symbol. Yes. Because no one had done that before. Mm -hmm. And we were integrating conversation during Jim Crow. You had blacks and whites standing together, young and old, women and children. Everybody was out there listening to her. And from then on, it was these political figures saying, How can we push it? the conversation ahead with her being a fixture in yes. that, you know, so, I mean, mm -hmm. there, there could, we could be here for weeks, months, just talking about her legacy and everything that she's done, all of the accolades from just being the epitome of grace, um, class, elegance, dignity, and just the humanitarian, the humanitarian that she was, um, and just performing, coming from humble beginnings, purchasing this home which is now her museum, then going off to Europe and performing for kings and queens Correct. and befriending first ladies before that was a thing and right. geniuses who was like, you know, you never know who you're going to touch and how uh, it's all going to come out and work out. So how would you say, um, like you, you kind of spoke on it a little, but if you could sum up in like five words who Marian Anderson was to you and what her legacy means and why, I guess it's more than five words, why is it so important to continue her legacy? Marian Anderson was light. Mm. Marian Anderson was light and light illuminates everything. Her example of her womanhood, her example of her root and her African American being, her example of her life as an artist and a humanitarian 
that's light. And if you walk in the light, you too can live in your own greatness, despite the oppression, despite the hardships, the pitfalls that will come in your path along your way. And why would we not do everything in our power to preserve that story, that history, this national historical landmark? I always say, Marian Anderson's home, this national historical landmark is just as important as every other national historical landmark in the city of Philadelphia, the United States of America, every cultural institution. She deserves the attention, she deserves the respect, she deserves the support, her home, where the story is told, where the life was lived, deserves that attention, respect, and support. And through that, though it has been for the last 29 years, in this nonprofit organization, a cultural institution, that life, that light will live on through the young artists that come in these hallowed halls, through the men, women, and children that come to visit and see these exhibitions, through those who will attend the live performances, hear the lecture series. That's what it's about. It should stand the test of time, just like the Betsy Ross House, just like the Ben Franklin House, just like the American Revolutionary Museum. It is that important. We talked about all of these things. I don't know another American artist who has had that many interactions with other American historic archetypes that Mary and Anderson did. And you only listed a few. Yeah. But how many from Albert Einstein to Eleanor Roosevelt to Duke Ellington to Paul Robeson to the Nicholas Brothers to all of these people. I mean, how many presidents did she not only live under, but she was the ambassador. She was one of the first African-American and one of the few Americans to be a United States ambassador under multiple sitting presidents. She represented America to the, to the continent of Africa and the continent of Asia. She, her story is like no other. And um, that alone puts her in a pantheon separate of anyone else. Yes. Oh my gosh. You guys have done some incredible work preserving her legacy and um, archives of hers. You've had some obstacles here. There was a flood, right? And now you guys are in restoration mode right now. So that's why we're unfortunately able to show all of the incredible things that you house here. But you're not giving up. This is too important. How can people support not only just you, but the museum and the legacy of Miss Anderson? If you believe in the power and the light of this history, our history, our culture. We invite you to visit our website, www.marianandersonhistoricalsociety.weebly.com. Call our office today, 215-779-4219. You can find us on all forms of social media, the Marian Anderson Museum and Historical Society. You can become a member, a donor, a supporter, adopt the museum, become a friend. Your support means that this national historical landmark, this black national historical landmark can be preserved for generations to come. And that's what's important. That's what's meaningful. Our history, our culture, our legacy being preserved being supported for generations to come. And we thank you in advance because we know that there are those that are going to be able to step up and meet this call and support the continued preservation and programming and life of the Marian Anderson Museum and Historical Society.
I know that we are going to become members right now. <laughs> right now, just, I mean, even before coming here, it was like, okay, we're gonna definitely support, but like just sitting here, being in this room, being in this house, being in your presence and feeling her energy and her presence and all of the incredible artists and pioneers through all genres of music that walk these halls, that have been in the same space, there's no way that we can't support. So thank you so much for taking the time and we know that you're extremely busy, so we appreciate it. Hey guys, make sure, again, you support this very extremely important um, cause, the Marion Anderson Museum here in Philadelphia and everything that Jillian is doing. Make sure you check them out and um, Happy Women's History Month. I mean, amen to that. And we'll see you next time on thisisarmy.com. Take care.